Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some warnings of Jesus over living the hypocritical life. Uh, we're calling the series Removing the Masks, and, and really what we're doing is we're finishing out Matthew chapter 6. And I would like you guys to all make the commitment this week to be here next week and to be here the week after that and the week after that until we finish this series, and then go ahead and say, well, maybe I'll skip out. Well, hopefully you don't do that. But there's an important reason why we're saying this, and I'm asking this, is because what we're trying to do in looking at the entire chapter of Matthew 6 is we want to come to Christ with a non-hypocritical approach to our worship as family, as brothers and sisters. And the only way we can get this done is if every single one of you is here. We're looking at how to live a lifestyle, how to worship Christ in a way that we remove two-facedness, alternate lifestyle, a life of heartless worship. And in between these passages that we'll look at is the series that we just finished in the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that calls out in true form, in your true voice to the Father above, saying, I'm putting away my mask, I'm being vulnerable with you, God. I'm being vulnerable with you, Dad. I'm being real so you can truly hear me. And you see, God's call... Sorry, i got to check my wireless. They're letting me know that. God's call... Is that I get off mute. There we go. Sorry, guys. God's call is that we take off our fakeness. And that we show our true self to Him. That we would come to Him with our true form, our true self, and just reveal ourselves to Him so He can reveal Himself to us. I told this story the other day to, uh, man, I, actually I don't remember who. You, you know, uh, they say the first thing to go when you start getting old is your memory. You know what the second thing is? I don't really remember. Anyways... Um, <laughs> I was telling this story to I don't remember who and I don't remember which scenario, but my sister um, had this uh, thing with my nephew that every time he would tell a lie, uh, he would just come up with this, the most insane stories in the world. I mean, he was just so far-fetched, you could tell it was just a complete uh, lie. He would come and you'd say, well, well, and I'm not saying the nephew's name for those of you that are waiting for that. She'd say, what happened to this glass? Why is there glass broken on the floor? Well, this lizard climbed out of the air duct and leaped. And then at the same time, a cat came from nowhere and just knocked every... You know, he would just come up with the most insane lies and stories to explain what he had done wrong. And so my sister said, you know, whenever you lie, I can read it on your forehead. And so he got really concerned about that. And so this one day, she said, what happened? What is going on? What did you do? And he comes up to her and he goes, so this is what happened. And you see, the truth is, that's how our Heavenly Father is. All the fakeness that we think that we're bringing... All the masks that we may wear in front of him, he sees right through it. And he sees right to the heart. And so what we're doing here is saying, Lord, I'm putting away my masks. I'm putting away my fakeness. I'm being vulnerable to you. My falsehoods are gone so I can grow closer to you in spirit and in truth. So I can grow closer to you and depend on you more. And that's what we're looking to do and accomplish within this series. But before we get into today's sermon, I'd like to take a moment where we all come together as brothers and sisters and we go before the Lord. Let's all pray together, shall we? Dear precious Heavenly Father, as we get into your message today and we get into your word, we just pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and just pour in. That you take out the falsehoods. That you take out all bitterness and anger. You take out the deceit. You'd replace it with mercy, grace, and love. Lord, speak to us today as we open your word. 
And we pray this in Jesus' precious, most holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at verses 16 to 18. And we're going to try to break them down in the best way we can. And unpack what the Lord has to say to us here. This is Jesus speaking. And he says in verse 16, Whenever you fast, do not put on gloomy faces as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men. But your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. We hear a lot about prayer when it comes to Scripture. We know that every time Jesus did a miracle, or just about every time, he would spend time in prayer, or after he had done the, the, the miracle, he would go and spend time in prayer with the Lord, with the Father. So we have lots of teaching on, on prayer, but very little on fasting. Why? Well, the best answer can be found, actually, by going back to Jesus. And let's take a look at Matthew chapter 9. Looking at verses 14 through 15. And we'll stop in the middle of 15. Then the disciples of John came to him, came to Jesus, asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? So John's disciples come to Jesus, uh, and and they come to the twelve, they look at the twelve, and they, they notice that when everybody else is gloomy, when everybody else is hungry, when everybody else is not feeling well because they've been fasting, the disciples are there feasting. They're full, they're celebrating, they're having a good time. And they're saying, why is this taking place, Jesus? John's in prison. We should be fasting and praying. We should be beseeching the Lord on His behalf. We should be in mourning that, that one of our teachers has been taken. But what ends up happening? They're looking at the, the twelve and they're saying, but look at you guys. You're feasting. You're eating. You're, 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 you're jovial. You're having a good time. What's going on? We, we've been expecting you to be the conqueror, and, and as of yet, you haven't conquered. And, and look, John is, is in trouble. The Herods are just as bad as they had ever been. What's going on? Well, as was the tradition at that time, they were spending time in prayer and fasting. Um, John believed in fasting, he believed in prayer, he believed in reflection of your past to prepare you for what God was doing now. He believed in that type of repentance, he believed in that type of mourning of rejection, in time of reflection. And then they look at Jesus and the disciples feasting while they were fasting, and they were just not really upset, but perplexed by this. And they simply just want to know, Why? And Jesus tells them, these men are in time of celebration. You see, you guys are in time of mourning. Your your teacher, your rabbi has been taken. You're reflecting on your sins of the past. You're reflecting on the bad things happening to you. But these men are in celebration because I'm with them at this time. They are celebrating because there's a marriage that is about to take place. And they're excited over it. They're celebrating a marriage that was going to happen in the future that they themselves didn't even understand. A marriage that Jesus knew fully was going to take place. And he alludes to. Take a look at Matthew, uh, the next verse. Verse 15, it says... But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then, then they will fast. 
The time of sorrowfulness and reflection will come for my disciples. The time when they sit there mourning and the time when they are are looking back at their mistakes and looking back at, at what took place with me, that is going to come, and we know it did. We know that disciples were were in a room locking themselves away and and scared and and just wondering what took place. What happened? Our Jesus was taken from us. And they were in that time of sorrowfulness and, and reflection just like John's disciples were. You see, the old fasting system was a reflection on mistakes Uh, and failures, a time of reflection of the ruts that you were in. It was a way of getting an audience before the Lord, before the throne, in your times of pain. But the disciples were in a celebration mode. They They were celebrating the King of Kings being with them. They were celebrating their rabbi. And Jesus explains that. How can I, how can these guys be in mourning when I am here in their midst? How can they be fasting when I am in their presence? Let's keep on reading in Matthew 9, verse 16. But no one puts a patch on unshrunken clothes, of unshrunken clothes, on an old garment. For the patch pulls away from the garment and is a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst. And the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Jesus is saying, I'm not here to patch the Pharisee system. I'm not here to tell you to spend time in fasting and in mourning and, and reflection as the Pharisees do. I'm not here to patch John's work. I'm not here to put new wine into old wineskins. As his example shows, new patches on old clothes tear away and it makes it worse because the shrinkage that takes place for the new patch will tear away and rip that rip even worse than it was before. And he's saying, and I'm not here to pour new wine into old bags because what ends up happening is that yeast expands. It's going to tear those wineskins. And that new wine that you've been waiting over and looking over, it's going to be wasted and gone. You see, God's plans were to finish the old system through Christ. To complete it through Christ's sacrifice. Take a look at Jesus' own words in Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18. It says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. In Jesus' own words, he was not here to do away with the old system, but to fulfill the sacrificial system. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is accomplished. And let me ask you, what were Jesus' dying words upon the cross? It is finished. It is finished. You see, God's plans were to finish the old system and start something anew. The very words that Hebrews 10.20 tell us is that we have a new and better way. Not a patch on the old system and the old beliefs. Not a patch, but something fresh. His ideas are not to rework the old system but to make a new and better way through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Jesus' death fulfilled the old sacrifice system. His new is not like the old sacrifice ways. His new is through grace. His new is through mercy. His new is through love. And that's how he's looking, and he's saying what the, the Pharisees were doing with the fasting, and he was looking at what John's disciples were doing with fasting, and he says, that, I don't want any part of that. That's not what I have planned. That's not what I'm doing. That's an old patch. And I'm bringing something new. That's some old wine and old wineskins. And I have something new and I have something better. 
Instead of patches, a new coat would be given. Instead of old wine, new wine and new wineskins would be given. And part of the feasting of the bridegroom, part of this celebration the disciples had no clue over, had to do with this new creation that Jesus was forming. Jesus was presenting. Jesus was preparing for. It was the marriage of Jesus and this new clothing that He would present. It was between Jesus and the new wineskins, which would be the church, the bride of Christ. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5. And looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verse, starting at verse 25, it, this is a very commonly read passage within weddings. In fact, we just had one the other day. It says, Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. New wine and new wineskins, a new coat with no patches needed. So husbands also ought to love their wives as, the, as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does also his church. Because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And get this, brothers and sisters, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. New wineskins for new wine and a new coat. The marriage of Jesus and his church was what they were preparing for, what they were celebrating. You can look at this celebrating that the disciples and Jesus were doing at this time as, as kind of like the stag party for Christ. The, the, the bachelor party for the wedding that was about to take place. This was Jesus being celebrated for the wedding that was about to take place. And that's what they were doing. It wasn't a time to, to mourn. It wasn't a time to be sad and to be sorrowful. He was sending the new clothing soon. That new wine was coming soon. It was going to be fresh off the presses right off after His death, burial, and resurrection. The Holy Spirit would be the bridegroom's gap, the bridge to the gap in His absence. Instead of having to fast to have an audience before the Lord, we would have the Holy Spirit within us. So we had an audience and we have an audience with the Lord 24-7. The Holy Spirit is literally God's ring on the finger of His church as the symbol of His love and commitment towards us. It was His seal to show His ownership and love for us. Amen? For the Pharisees and John's followers, fasting was a time to go through pain and remembrance. Remember the pain that you caused God in your own sins. It was a time of penitence, self-denial, and to show how really sorry you felt for the sin in your life. Or it was a time to remember the sorrow that you had to go through or that the nation had endured at one time or another. But Christ doesn't want old wineskins for his new wine. He doesn't want patches for the brand new coat that he's given us. For his disciples, fasting would take on something completely new. For us, it would take on something great of power of reflection on the power and the strength of Christ. It would help us in guidance. It would help us to beseech God and become 
a faith builder for every believer's life. You see the difference between the old and the new. Take a look in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. My dad said that once. (laughs) And is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. You see, what was taking place was this demon that was in his son was trying to kill the son, trying to maim the son, trying to harm him. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out. What's taking place here, Jesus? I mean, we've done this before. What's going on? Why couldn't we do this? Get what Jesus says right here. This is important. And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and have you ever seen a mustard seed? It is an itty bitty little thing. If you have faith the size of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. How many mountains do we have blocking the path in our life and the walk we have with Jesus? When we should be saying, get out of here. Look at verse 21, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and by fasting. A faith builder. That's what it's become. That's what Jesus' new system has become with mind of fasting. It was a faith builder. It was something to gain strength. It was something to gain power and build what you have in your relationship with Him. It requires prayer and reflection on the Christ. Acts 13, 1 through 3, we see something very similar. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manium, who had brought, been brought up by, with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they said to them, Go away. (laughs) They sent them away. You see, in Acts 8, the church is formed already. The Holy Spirit is indwelling. The, The Holy Spirit is with the people. Okay, so the church is being formed. The new system, the new wine has already been poured. It's already taking place. And what's taking place here? Are the, are the disciples, are the apostles, are, are the teachers, are the prophets, are they coming and fasting because of the doom and gloom of the, the rut that they're in at this point? No. They're going for guidance. They're going for strength. They're going for the power of Christ to come upon them. And so... The Holy Spirit comes on them and says, listen, I've set aside Paul and Barnabas. Pray for their strength. Pray for their guidance. Spend time in fasting and prayer for their journey. And you see, that's what takes place in every believer's life. As we need guidance, we need strength, we need direction. And instead of having a satellite view, we need to narrow it down to laser beam vision. And that's where fasting comes into play. 
is we take out the satellite view. We say, I'm going to focus solely on Christ. I'm going to focus solely on this thing set before me so I can find the answer. I can find guidance. I can find his strength. Looking on a couple, a chapter later, in Acts 14, 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Again, praying and fasting for the guidance and direction of God's church. Do you think praying and fasting is important to the believer's life? I sure think it is if this is something that we are to do for guidance, for strength, for vision, for direction, for faith building. Fasting is a deliberate abstinence of physical gratification to achieve a spiritual goal. It's a denial of the flesh to gain a response from the Spirit. It's renouncing the natural to invoke the supernatural. It's saying no to yourself, to distractions, to the distractions in life. So you become awake and alive to what the Spirit has at hand. When you eat, let me ask you, what do you eat for? Let's just take a moment and reflect. Why are you eating? Now, I know some of us, sometimes we're eating just because we like eating, okay? But most of the time, why are you eating? Most of the time, you're eating for yourself. You're not eating for the person sitting next to you. When uh, I wish that was the case, because then I would enjoy a lot more ice cream because somebody else would gain the pounds. But why are we eating? We're, gain, we're doing it for our own satisfaction, for our own nourishment. I don't eat for you, and you don't eat for me. When you're eating, you're concerned for three people and three people alone. Isn't that correct? Me, myself, and I. You become obedient to yourself, to your stomach. But let me ask you, when you fast, you're doing it for soul food. You're doing it for soul focus. And you're doing it for a better communion with God. Food satisfies us, but fasting satisfies our hunger for God. When we are hungry, we put something in satis- inside of us to satisfy that hunger, do we not? When we're fasting, we're saying, my soul is crying out for something, and it's more important than my belly. My soul is crying out for something. I need focus, I need direction, I need guidance in my life, and I can only get that from my Heavenly Father. I can only get that through His hand of mercy to guide me through his Holy Spirit. The reason we get focused when we fast is that we're putting more importance on the inner man than on the outer man. Let's think about it in another light, in another terms. How much is the cost of dirt? Well, let's think about it. If you go to Home Depot and you buy the organic soil and the organic potting soil and maybe you add a little compost for those flowers that you're about to plant, maybe you're looking about 275, right? Somewhere around there. If you go for the cheap stuff, if you think that, oh, well, I don't need to use the organic soil, I don't need to use the, the compost with manure and all that in it, I'm just going to go for the regular old potting soil. Uh, maybe you're talking about a buck, right? So, the Bible says that we are formed out of the dust of the ground. So I guess that means that we're worth about 275 somewhere around there, depending on what you put uh, your value on. Maybe you're the organic soil, so you're, maybe you're about 37 bucks. Well, we'll do that. So when you feed yourself, you're feeding the dirt side of you. You're feeding the 275 or or the or the one dollar side of you. 
But when you're fasting, you're feeding the part that never dies. You're feeding the part that keeps on going. You're feeding the part that you can't place value on because of the importance. You see, we spend so much time feeding the one part that once we pass, just lays in the ground. And we don't spend time feeding the more important part. We don't spend time getting into God's Word and saying, Lord, guide me, teach me, direct me, give me laser pinpoint focus here. Well, we should be doing more of that. We need to stop feeding the cheap part of us and neglecting the value part, valuable part of us. And the way we do that is through guidance and direction for our soul. Some people in sales will go the entire day without eating. Why? Because they get so busy, they're trying to, to close an important sale. Students will skip meals because they're so focused on, on study and trying to pass exams. And you won't stop when you're, when you're busy. You, you just got this goal of let me get it done already. And so sometimes we'll go the entire day or half a day without eating just to get something done or to meet a deadline or to pass an exam. And what about hearing an answer to something that you've been pleading for? What about when you need guidance and direction for a decision in your life? What about when you're dealing and battling with these big mountains that are sitting in the middle of the path of your road and your relationship and your walk with Christ? It's then that we say, oh, well, I can't go without my food. Oh, I can't go without watching TV. And those are the times that we need the direction, we need the laser pinpoint focus the most. Those are the times that we should be going a little bit without so our soul gets filled. Fasting is not a time of feeling sorry for sins. It's not a time of gloominess or moping around because Jesus said that's exactly what the hypocrites do. And that's the old patch. That's the old system. And what I got is something great, and it's filled with joy, it's filled with growth, it's filled with a relationship with me. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, that's the Pharisee's way that you're doing it when you do it in that style, when you do it moping, when you do it with ash, when you do it with just that, that gloom on your face. I have something new for you, it's filled with joy. It's in joy of the connection and the might of a mighty God who wants to do mighty things through His people. It's a connection between you and the Heavenly Father, the Creator of this world, a person that can speak the entire universe into creation. It's joy in the marriage relationship you have with Christ. That's what fasting is. Joy of being part of His body. Joy in the growth that he brings. I stole a quote from Tony Evans, and I really want us to think about this right here. We sacrifice the desire of the flesh because we have a greater need of the Spirit. One of the primary reasons that you should fast is that there is a crisis need in your life or the lives of someone else close to you. What we're talking about is pinpoint, laser focus. We're talking about building the relationship with Christ. We're talking about strength for our physical soul, not our physical body. We're talking about growth. There's a story that I loved. It was about two lumberjacks. An older lumberjack and the new young buck who thought he was so much bigger and stronger. And he came up and, and he said, man, he's looking at this old guy, a little bit smaller. His muscles were getting old. And he says, man, I am going to destroy this guy when it comes to chopping down these trees. Look how big I am. 
I'm going to chop down a bunch of trees and I'm going to make lots of money. This old guy, he's just going to get a few trees. He's going to be done. So they both go out and this young guy, he starts whacking away. And man, he's just falling trees all over the place. And the old guy, he, kept, he would get down a tree and man, he was sweating profusely. He was really working hard at it. And then he would stop. And man, the young guy, he's looking and he's just giggling to himself. He's saying, man, that old guy, he's going to quit by the end of the day. And look at me, I've already got ten trees to his three. Well, he starts looking at the old guy at the end of the day. And man, he, every few trees, every three, four trees, he would stop. And he's going, man, that old guy's gassing. Look at him. He can't make it. He's not going to make it. Every 15 minutes or so, he's done. Look at him. Well, at the end of the day... They sat down and they start counting the trees so they could tally what they were going to pay the guys. And at the end of the day, they're both the same. The old guy had the same exact size pile as the young guy. The old guy had the same exact number of trees as the young guy. And the young guy got really furious. He's going, what, what happened here? No, 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 no. You worked so slow. You, you were just... You, you kept on resting. You know, what's going on here? Did you steal some of my trees? And the old guy looked at him and started to giggle a little bit. He said, those breaks and resting that you said I kept on taking, he goes, that was to sharpen my axe. He goes, because from time to time, hitting those trees over and over again, your axe gets bare. Your axe gets dull. It doesn't have the same sharpness as it once had. And every time I sat down, it was to sharpen my axe. You see, a lot of us has been working very hard with dull axes, wondering why the trees in our life aren't falling. A lot of us have been praying and looking and saying, why aren't these trees and these barriers in my life? Why am I not getting guidance? Why am I not feeling the strength of God? Why am I not getting these things when the trees are still standing there and we're working with dull axes? You can swing away, but maybe nothing's happening. Because these Trees of cancers, these trees of dust, these trees of sickness, these trees of temptations, these trees of sin will stay in your life until you sharpen your axe with Christ. That's the only way you can swing away and overcome is through the power of Him who strengthens you. That's what fasting and prayer and getting into God's Word at that time is all about. It's a time of reflection of God and Christ and the power and the strength that you can get through Him. It's about sharpening the axe of the inner man so we can have the spiritual victory. Fasting is for sharpening our spiritual focus by removing the distractions in life. And isn't there so many of them? It's for building our faith and depending on the Lord's strength. Not our own. Because too many times we depend on our own strength to get us by. Too many times, even in ministry, we can depend on ourselves to pull ourselves through. And that just is weakening. That's burning the candle at both ends. When we should be spending time with Him and focusing on Him and depending on His strength. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, as we close today, let me ask you this. Have you been sharpening your axe? Have you been seeking the laser accuracy and focus that we need? Have you been going for strength and the Lord's guidance? Are you looking to build your faith and your relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, hopefully you've answered yes to every single one of those then don't keep chopping the trees with the dole axe. Don't keep going on day by day avoiding what we should be doing. Don't go day by day going through life chopping, chopping, chopping. 
wearing yourself out with the dull axe. Our faith is a relationship and not a religion. You see, the old way was a religion that just told you you have to do this, you have to feel guilty, you have to feel bad, you have to do these things. But ours says, build your relationship with me. Focus on me, and I'll take care of the rest. Focus on my love. Make my joy complete within you. Let's build this together. But as we're told in James, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So start sharpening that axe, brothers and sisters. Start building your relationship with Christ. Remove the falsehoods within your life. Remove the mask that you wear when you're standing before God. And draw near. Let's end in a word of prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And Lord, I'm in need of your strength, your guidance, your focus, just as much as anybody in this room. Lord, I pray that through your hand of guidance, We can have strength. We can have laser pinpoint focus. We can look at these mountains in our life, these hard times, and we can say, get out of my path, Lord. Lord, we can look at these hard times in our life and we can see the growth that comes at the end. Lord, because everything that is in our life is there to grow us in our dependency on you. 